Thank you very much, uh, Eduardo, Nathan. Uh, I kind of doubt it. Uh, we've, I'm going to make this kind of light because I don't know what's coming in the future. I don't think any of us know what's coming in the future. A lot of us have clues, hints, et cetera, of, of what may be coming, but none of us know uh, for sure. I really feel humble to be here today because there are some giants in the world of minimally invasive surgery in this room. Two are at the front desk. Terrence Fulham in the, in the back. Armando is here. Uh, we just heard from, from uh, my friend Alessio. Alex Caritas is representing Australia. There are all kinds of great people who come to these kind of meetings because they know that they can learn something from somebody. I don't think it's going to be me, but they can learn something from somebody, and that makes it, that's what makes it worthwhile. <clears throat> I am from Texas. I did have the pleasure of having a, um, a number of people visit me in the past, but uh, uh, I think many of them have been pleasurable, and most of them have been very willing to move ahead with laparoscopy. Uh, I do not have a conflict of interest of any kind. <clears throat> Albert Einstein once said, if you do the same thing over and over again, you can never expect a different outcome. And it's, it's amazing where I still hear this in this meeting, American College meetings, all the meetings out there, people professing what they've done 45 years ago and still having not the greatest results in the world and not wanting to look at something else. And I, I'm probably guilty, as guilty of that as anybody else. <coughs> as far as colorectal cancer is concerned, there's about 140,000 plus people diagnosed with with colorectal cancer in the United States each year. Um, about 50,000 people die every year of colorectal cancer. It's the second leading cause of death in men and the third leading cause of death in women. Let's just look at what technology has done in the past. We always look back at, at, at uh, Ernest Miles and say, man, it was really crude what he was doing. It was really, un you know, what was he trying to do? He was trying to move surgery ahead. What technical event allowed him to do that? Well, it was general anesthesia. Because prior to that time, you couldn't take a rectal cancer out because the patient wouldn't let you. You couldn't, you didn't have enough people to hold the people still. So Ernest Miles actually used technology to move, to move uh, uh, surgery ahead. Uh, we know that a lot of the, his principles were great. A lot of the principles weren't so great, but he was certainly a pioneer in, in moving things ahead in rectal cancer. <clears throat> we all know this giant. Um, he is another one that used technology to forward what he thought should be done with rectal cancer. And his technology was staplers, because when he got staplers, he was able to get down to around two to three centimeters with, a, with an anastomosis. He also had the cautery, which Miles did not have when he was doing his uh, early APRs. Uh, <clears throat> Bill Hill is, is a tremendous friend of all of ours. And we all learn a lot from this gentleman. Just when he opens his mouth, you learn something. Every single solitary thing. So what was the next big change in, after Bill Hill? Well, I think we have to say it was probably laparoscopy. Our antibiotics improved. Our, as far as col colorectal cancer treatment was concerned, our antibiotics improved. Our chemotherapy improved. But we were kind of at a steady line because we had reached kind of the those of us that believed in what Bill Hill did uh, kind of reached a, a pinnacle, and then laparoscopy came along. Laparoscopy began in 1989. We actually did our first animal work in 1989 and 1990, proving that we could do it. Um, the first case report was by Cooperman out of New York in 1991. This is the only case he had ever done and ever did do. <clears throat> These three gentlemen, at least two of them are gentlemen, and the guy in the middle we can say is a ringer, recognized early 
a couple of three things. One, the value of what laparoscopy was going to bring to colorectal surgery. And number two, we needed to improve and teach. But the third and most important thing, particularly as far as this group is concerned, was the importance of Central and South America. <clears throat> because these three guys probably spent more time in 91, 92, and 93 in South America than all other teachers coming uh, combined as far as colorectal surgery is concerned. So we got to know, be known fairly well for whatever <clears throat> when we went to South America and Central America. And I can say for myself, it was one of the absolute pleasures and, and uh, uh, highlights of my life. <clears throat> the first international presentation for uh, laparoscopic colorectal surgery was in France in 1991. Uh, it was greeted by boos, disbelief, but it was amazing. It was a room about this size, actually about three times this size, and it was standing room only. <clears throat> and there was nobody in France at that time doing laparoscopic colon surgery. I spent a lot of time in these countries, 91 and 92, uh, usually doing the first colorectal case that was done there. Uh, and learned a lot doing it and hopefully transferred a lot of, of uh, information. It's interesting that when we look at laparoscopic colorectal surgery, how it was essentially rejected. Essentially, stop sign, don't do it by the American College, ASCRS, and even SAGES to some extent. I think all of them came around, but it just took a while to do it. The thing that really changed it was the first uh, trial, uh, which was presented in Seattle in 1996, uh, where it was shown that laparoscopy was at, at the worst equivalent to open surgery for colon procedures. I think that the technology that has come along has been very, very important to all of us, and probably the number one thing is the stapler. Uh, certainly the cameras, the the improvement in the cameras, improvement in the light sources, improvement in our technique, uh, medial to lateral dissection, which before laparoscopy was really not known very, very well. All these things have really improved and have moved laparoscopic colon surgery ahead. Of, and these are two of the most important ones that you see on the slide now, which are the staplers, and they're continually uh, being improved and the vessel sealers. Um, I, can, I can remember the early surgery we did, particularly when Eduardo visited me in 1996, 97, 98. Uh, we were clipping most of our vessels because we didn't have a vessel sealer. We we're depending on cautery, ligation, and clips, and that's incredibly slow and fairly expensive. <clears throat> There are advances in technology that are going to continue to occur forever, and I think that adoption of, of these technologies into minimally invasive surgeries is going to lead uh, to more improvement in our lives. And as surgeons, we have to be willing to adapt to these, to these changes and to utilize them for the advantage of treating our patients better. And you just saw two of them, which was the stapler and the, and the ligature. Uh, I think that we've got better staplers coming down the line. I think we're going to see some single-line staplers. We're going to see absorbable staplers uh, so that we get rid of the uh, staples altogether. And I think we're also going to be looking in the very near future of more and more endoluminal stapling and staplers. And this may put us out of business. And that's one thing we all need to be aware of as colorectal surgeons that that the endoscope is going to do more and more of what we currently do. And if we don't adapt to that, we're not going to be able to keep up. Speaking of endoscopy, this plays a very important role in endoluminal and transluminal surgery. We have used and felt that the endoscope was important from the very first and from our first laparoscopic procedure own, we have used the endoscope of a colonoscope or an endoscope on, on every case that we do. 
Uh, there's no doubt that this is the gold standard for examining the mucosa, but also now it's being used more and more to take care of the disease processes. So I think we're gonna see some fantastic advances in the endoscope and in what can be done. And as surgeons, it behooves us to not give away this modality of treatment. And the way you have to work to keep it is to make sure in your operating room that you have an endoscope. And if, you, if the take home message from me is go home and be sure you have the availability of an endoscope, a colonoscope in your operating room um, because there's very few gastroenterologists who are gonna wanna come into your operating room and have all the delays and the, and the, the, the wasted time that we have in the OR. So after about the first or second time, they get tired of it and says, well, why don't you go ahead and do it? That's what we did. It worked like a champ. They never came back again. I think radiology is going to play a much more important role in the future, more than the CAT scan and even the CT angio uh, in the future. And, and I think this is going to go back to something that Alessio said. I think this is going to enhance our ability to teach. I was talking with a couple of experts last night about how the anatomy, the anatomy is what makes us go around. It's, make, it's what makes us function as surgeons. Understanding the anatomy of the individual patients that we're working on at the time. And I, I believe firmly that no two patients have the same anatomy. And what we see in the anatomy books is just an average. It is not what my patient has. I have yet to have a patient who reads the anatomy book before they have their surgery. They just don't do it. And thank God, because they're going to tell me what their anatomy is, and it's going to be entirely different. Radiology can help us understand a lot of this anatomy, and I think we'll eventually use it a lot. We're going to be using it particularly with the MRI and the CT angio, uh, angiograms. Uh, we're going to be able to superimpose our patient as we're looking at them on with the laparoscope. We'll be able to superimpose their anatomy as far as vascular supply is concerned right on the, uh, right on the, the, the monitor at the same time. That's already being done, son, at ERCAD. It was talked about. 10 years ago, and it's now coming to fruition, and we're going to be able to really, I think, identify vessels, so hopefully in the future, bleeding problems will, they'll always exist, but hopefully they'll be less and less as time goes on. <clears throat> robotic surgery is here to stay. I personally do not do robotic surgery. I, I'm not sure that I'm capable of learning it, but there are some unbelievable laparoscopic, I'm sorry, robotic surgeons in this room. I think we're gonna see more and more robotic surgery, not only for standard colorectal uh, cases, I'm gonna disagree a little bit with Alessio, uh, but I think we're going to see it also more and more uh, with intraluminal surgery. So I, th I think the day may come and Alessio, uh, I'm sorry, Alice Keratosis has been a great proponent of this uh, from Australia, and that is pro programmable robotic systems where if a patient has appendicitis, you compare the CAT scan, you compare the anatomy, the CT angio, which you should be able to get at the same time, and you can plug it into the, to the robot and it'll do the operation while you're watching from somewhere else. So I think that's coming. We all have to adapt to that. As a surgeon, I don't want to lose that control, but I think that we're going to have to face up to that in time. Transanal endoscopic mitral surgery is already in our hands. Uh, Gerhard Boos had no idea what he was taught, where he where the surgery and the techniques that he developed in 1984 were going to go. 
but we all know that this has improved the care, the care of rectal cancer patients. This is still something in his infancy, working out most of the problems. We're getting there. It's just taking a good while. Who knows? One of these days, we may be able to move even further forward and have hand-assisted surgery. Does that ring any bells with anybody, Alessio? And if we go further than that, maybe we can even have single incision surgery. <laughs> that was meant as a joke, folks. <laughs> I think that's a fallback, but, you know, as surgeons, we always have to be able to convert to open at the current time we do. In the future, we may not have to, but I think we will, and we've seen that already with some of the fabulous presentations we've had this morning. So, in conclusion, the most important factors to ensure continued spread of minimally invasive surgery is safe, is safe in a substantial manner or a standardization of the surgical procedures as much as we can. I think medial to lateral is here to stay, although lateral to medial does have some place. Uh, a profound education uh, and training of the surgeon needs to be uh, continued. Uh, adequate technical equipment needs to be available and utilizing new equipment as it comes along. I think that we're headed toward earlier dete detex detection of colorectal cancer, either through gases uh, expelled through the mouth, through the flatus, or wherever, and we're going to be able to pinpoint those patients that need a colonoscopy long before the classic symptoms that we talk about are the age in, uh, limits that we have at the current time. So thank you very much for allowing me to give kind of a light talk uh, and I appreciate very much the opportunity.